Okay, folks, in this video we will discuss Lorraine Code's text, Taking Subjectivity into Account. What Code is giving us here is a feminist epistemology or a feminist theory of knowledge that offers both a criticism of mainstream epistemologies or the histories of theories of knowledge as well as a creative account of what a theory of knowledge ought to attend to. So what she's arguing should be pretty evident simply from the title of the text, taking subjectivity into account. So Code is arguing here that theories of knowledge ought to take subjectivity into account. That is, epistemologists have to attend to the location of the subject, the nature and situation and context of the subject of knowledge, of the knower, as much as they attend to the content of the knowledge claim, that is, the object of knowledge. So Code argues that, contra the history of Western epistemology, the necessary and sufficient conditions for justifying knowledge claims does not give us a complete epistemological project. A set of conditions for justification could only hold for a narrow set of empirical knowledge claims. So although necessary and sufficient conditions for, for knowledge claims, typically understood as the JTB model or justified true belief, are problematic on Code's view, because they do not account for all kinds of knowledge, though the kind of knowledge that can be evaluated by the model of justified true belief has been taken to be the model paradigm throughout the history of Western theories of knowledge. So Code is critiquing what is known as the S knows that P model. And this model simply means that some subject knows that some preposition. So to say that S knows that P means something like Johnny knows that the cat is on the mat or Jill knows that John is at home. So some subject of knowledge is said to know some object of knowledge. So the S knows that P model is taken as paradigm and on this model subjects are interchangeable. So if John knows that the cat is on the mat, anyone else could also know that the cat is on the map. Code is, is arguing that there's something prob problematic about taking the S knows that P model to be paradigmatic of all kinds of knowledge. This model marks the empiricist, positivist orientation that generates and enforces this kind of paradigm. So the S knows that P model, as paradigmatic, supports the belief that universally necessary and sufficient conditions of knowledge can be found. And this model, the S knows that P model, privileges certain kinds of scientific knowledge over the knowledge of everyday lives. And as she'll discuss later, particularly the ways in which we know other people. So dominant epistemologies have defined themselves by certain kinds of ideals for a pure objectivity and a value neutral methodology which is said to be achievable by knowers capable of achieving a kind of unbiased view from nowhere and this requires subjects of knowledge or knowers to transcend their particularity their contingency and the specificities of their particular location so the circumstances in which a knower knows are irrelevant. The interests of a, a given knower are irrelevant because knowers are ideally value neutral, interchangeable, and disembodied and unbiased. The problem though is that these ideals are unachievable and they erase the interplay between emotion and, and reason which there is a great deal of interesting work in cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience, neurobiology to support these kinds of claims. And erasing the interplay between reason and emotion obscures the connections between knowledge and power. We saw the importance of the relationship between knowledge and power in both Elkoff's piece, How is Epistemology Political? 
and in Gross's piece on bodies and knowledge, as well as in the text we read throughout the throughout the course, including text on gender, gender oppression, race, racial oppression, disability, disability oppression, and how it is that we come to have knowledge about certain kinds of people and how it is that certain kinds of people have knowledge about the world. So the S knows that P model as paradigmatic of, of knowledge generally supports the belief that cognitive products, the production of knowledge through cognition, are as neutral as the processes that produce them. So this mainstream approach supports the belief that if someone cannot transcend one, the specificities of one's subjectivity, of one's particular location, then there's no knowledge there worth analyzing. So on this view, knowledge has to be abstract and disembodied in order to be worthy of being called knowledge. And there's a, so, so there's a separation in the history of, uh, in the history of epistemology, the separation of the context of discovery of knowledge, the situation within which one comes to discover what they know, and the justification of that knowledge. And so justificatory procedures are said to purify knowledge of its contamination from the peculiar circumstances of everyday life. So these everyday circumstances and context, which are found in the context of discovery, are typically rendered part of the sociology of knowledge, not part of a theory of knowledge proper. That is, not part of the justification or evaluation of a given knowledge claim. So much like the point that both Gross and Elkoff have already made, even though this model of knowledge maintains that subjectivities are not taken into account, the subjectivities of those who are producing these theories of knowledge, typically members of privileged groups, middle class, white, heterosexual males, maintain the model by failing to acknowledge that their subjective experience, in fact, is at play in that knowledge formation. So the very values of a theory of knowledge that is disembodied, abstract, interchangeable, individualistic, requires a certain kind of subject to produce a theory of knowledge with those values. So in the history of of Western theories of knowledge, the complex, contentious, and locationally variable aspects of cognitive practice are excluded from analysis. So the epistemic community, the community of knowers, is seen as homogenous, and knowledge becomes a matter of interchangeable subjects, knowing instances, rather than knowing concrete particulars. So Code is trying to remap the epistemic terrain here by requiring an acknowledgement of the political investedness of knowledge-producing activity and the acknowledgement of responsibility to the epistemic community rather than to the evidence. So rather than a focus on, on the necessary and sufficient conditions of the justification or evaluation of knowledge claims, Code is arguing that we have to move our responsibility to an epistemic responsibility to the knowledge producing community. So for this reason, on Code's view, gender ought to be a primary analytic category. She's not making a claim about the ontology of gender, whether it's real or socially constructed, but she's saying that gender is not epistemically neutral. Gender is not neutral with respect to knowledge and knowledge production. Because gender is experienced differently, it plays into structures of power and dominance at diverse intersections with other specificities. And so if we took a look back at McKinnon's piece through the lens of Code's critique of Western epistemology, we might ask how structures of dominance and power, that is, how sexuality affects what a given subject can know. Does one's being a woman in a society where rape culture is the norm, 
affect what a person could know? Would a woman have access to knowledge that a man would not have access to? So again, what Code is trying to argue here is that the subjective factors of one's location should be taken into account, not only in terms of the context of discovery, but in terms of evaluation and justification procedures, though this does not mean that knowledge is relative or that knowledge is not, does not have a realist orientation. So it doesn't mean that we can't know things objectively about the world. It simply means that the subjective aspects of the knower are integral to the kinds of knowledge claims that one can and will make. So one thing that Code is identifying here that ties into some of the readings that we did earlier on in the course is the fact that knowers who are privileged in various ways, and you might think of Lugones' piece on playful world traveling, knowers that are privileged in particular ways allow a subject to believe that they're independent and autonomous, uh, that they're nowhere and everywhere, all the while they're located in particular positions of privilege. So the experiences and situations associated with women, for example, or gays, the elderly, the disabled, trans persons, blacks, Latinas, have been inferiorized and excluded from the production of theories of knowledge, which leads to a disbelief of the stability and predictability of the social order. So ideal objectivity is a generalization from the subjectivity of a small group of privileged persons who have produced theories of knowledge that claim ideal objectivity as a necessary condition and this is productive of a kind of we saying, the we being those who inform and maintain social structures of dominance, and a they saying, so a self or subject of knowledge, and an other of knowledge, an object of knowledge. So ideal subjects are interchangeable only across a narrow range of implicit group membership, typically middle class, white, educated, cisgendered, straight males. So when an S knows that P model is made paradigmatic, Code argues that the first task of a critical epistemology, whether it be feminist or not, requires critical analysis of the we. Who is the we? Who is the group producing the theory of knowledge? And how does their locatedness how does their privilege, how does their, the context of their subjectivity contribute to the theory that they're producing? So again, this is similar to the claim that Elkoff made in the previous reading. Further, Code argues that the S knows that P paradigm is problematic not only in effacing the subjects of knowledge, in narrowing the group of of epistemic subjects to, to the privileged, white, middle-class, cisgendered, able-bodied, heterosexual male, but it also effaces persons who come to occupy the P position, that is, the position of the object of knowledge, that which the knowledge is about. So in, on the S knows that P model, a, when a subject knows that P, where P is another person, this paradigm becomes problematic in a, di in a distinct way. Because when a person is put into the P position, that is, when a person is taken as the object of knowledge, their subjectivity and specificity are reduced to some interchangeable observable variables, and they're reduced to an instance rather than a particular in all of their specificity. So if you recall Lugonis's point, in Playful World Travel, she argued that when we arrogantly perceive others, we take some one, some one observable trait or characteristic, and we take that to be representative of the person generally. This is related to the claim that Code is trying to make when she argues that when people are the objects of knowledge, that is when we're perceiving others, and we perceive a given variable or trait, and we just take that as an instance, 
we are not able to see the person in all of their particularity. We don't see them as a particular person. We see them merely as an object of knowledge, and that object is having some particular trait. So in the same way that we see, for example, trees as being tall and green or alive, when we perceive arrogantly and we, and we take people as the objects of our knowledge, we take some variable or trait and simply see that as an instance. Oh, he is a black man. Oh, she is fat. And we take that person just to be an instance of that trait rather than to be a person in all of their specificity and multiplicity. So paradigms of knowledge are meant to capture the sort of forms or structures of legitimate knowledge. And by using, and by using these simple non-political examples as paradigms, like John knows that the cat is on the mat, Jill knows that that is an oak tree, this paradigm results in the assumption that all knowing is equally as transparent, equally as objective, equally as empirical and apolitical as the S knows that P model is. So for code, it's dangerous to ignore questions about subjectivity in the name of objectivity and value neutrality. Uh, she gives the example of Rushton's work on the scientific facts, the knowledge production about the values of racial groups. And she shows how accountability for this knowledge is abdicated and the legitimacy of the knowledge claims is implied by a particular paradigm of knowledge, this paradigm that Code is critiquing, yet that this is problematic because despite claims of objectivity and value neutrality, the impartial readings of the data are taken as brute facticity as legitimate knowledge claims, rather than as interpretations of data, which we know they are. Data is always interpreted. There's no such thing as raw data. It always has to be interpreted in a given way by a particularly located epistemic subject. So it's not enough to just be more rigorous empirically to guard against biases in the context of discovery. For code, the scope of epistemological investigation has to be expanded so that it merges with a moral and political inquiry. So we have to acknowledge that facts are always infused with values and that both facts and values are always open to debate and interpretation. So another way to put it is that evidence is not merely discovered or found, it's selected and it's selected by particular subjects who are located in particular situations with access to certain kinds of privileges. So the disinterested subject is an exception. It's not a rule, and it should not be the paradigm for what we understand a knower to be or a producer of knowledge to be. So contextual facts are always pertinent to knowledge production. Code also argues that in addition to taking subjectivity into account, we also need to do case-by-case -case analyses of the political and structural circumstances. In objective inquiry, the power relations and social structures, such as gender, have to be scrutinized and investigated. So this is another way of arguing exactly what Linda Alcoff was trying to argue when she argued that, the, that epistemology is political. Uh, but for code, she argues this from a kind of developmental perspective, claiming that knowing other people is a primary and fundamental way that epistemic subjects learn to know the world. That is, knowing other people is not like knowing objects such as trees or spoons or chairs, since people are not merely objects of knowledge, but they're also subjects of knowledge. And since knowing other people is primary in our cognitive development, and it's essential to our cognitive development, and there's a great deal of research on this, so the S knows that P model ought to be non-paradigmatic to understanding what it is to be an epistemic subject. So 
Cognitive capacities are grounded on knowing other people, and thus the S knows that P observation-based model is not paradigmatic. Claims to know another person, unlike claims to know that the cat is on the mat, require a kind of negotiation between knower and known. Again, think of Lugonis' playful world traveling. The subject and object positions ought to be interchangeable and reciprocal. The importance of knowing other people and taking subjectivity into account does not lead to relativism. It does not mean that there are no external facts, that knowledge is not real. Yet on the other hand, contra mainstream epistemologies, knowing the facts about a person does not mean that you know a person. The specificities of the knowing subject, even when they're put into the position of object, always have to be accounted for. So again, Code is claiming that the necessary and sufficient conditions for knowledge cannot be found where the experience of the knowing subject is not involved. Objectivity requires taking subjectivity into account. 